guys. Welcome to another episode of the Rose Quinn Podcast. Today, I have Maureen Moretti as our special guest. She is a literary agent with PS Literary Agency, where Carly Waters also works. So that's super exciting that we got two from the same agency to learn from. But before we get to our awesome interview with Maureen, let's talk about my favorite book of the episode. I posted about this on my Instagram and... I just want to fill everybody in here who doesn't see that, or I tweeted about it too, but anyway. It is The Door to January by Jillian French, and it um, actually won a little giveaway fr- um, on her Instagram to get this book and do a review of it. It's on her backlist. Her newest one that just came out was The Missing Season, so this book came out a couple years ago, but... Um, it was so good. She told me, she was like, it's a little bit different than what I normally write. Some people, you know, it's a little too different for them, but it was so amazing. So let's read the blurb. Ever since 16-year-old Natalie Payson moved away from her hometown of Bernier, I'm terrible at pronouncing things, Maine, she's had nightmares, and not just the usual, usual ones. These are inside her, pulling her, calling her back, drawing her to a door, a house, a place, a time, full of fear, full of danger. So this summer, Natalie's going back to face up to a few things. The reason she left town in the first place, the boy she's trying hard not to trust, and the door in her dreams. But once she goes through the door into a murky past, she's entangled into someone else's world, and only Natalie can help right the wrongs of both the past and the present. Breakthrough author Jillian French skillfully weaves together themes of small-town bullies, unsolved murders, time travel, and the force of the spirit in this gripping paranormal thriller. I mean, if you listen to that last sentence, small-town bullies, unsolved murders, time travel, and paranormal, it's like everything I ever wanted in a book. And I went to the park. I, my kids and I, we go on a, a walk every morning, so we go to one park and I read part of it there and I'm a super fast reader so I can usually read an average size book in about three hours if you know it's all I do and I was so I was just stuck in this book that then I took my kids to a school park and sat there and they kept coming up to me and they were like can we go now but I had you know 15 pages left I was like no just let me finish because it was so good It was such a great book. So I finished it all in one day, and um, it really is a perfect mixture of all of those things and has a little bit of everything. It definitely has some personal struggles just as a teenager and growing up in a small town and bullies that everybody deals with everywhere to a really awesome paranormal twist. So The Door to January uh, by Jillian is one that you want to read. The next thing I want to do before we get to Maureen, I know you guys are all so excited to listen to her answer my questions about queries, which is everything we want to know from literary agents. I want to do a little lit chit chat, and it's inspired by something I saw, and I'll explain. I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, I recently went through like a last revision on when Jay Bird went missing, had some beta readers get back to me, and I saw some things I wanted to fix, and One of the things I normally do is read my work out loud. I think a lot of people catch weird sounding sentences when we read out loud or I catch a lot of like forgotten words that, you know, I'm just quickly skimming over the page with my eyes as I read and I forget or I don't see that there's words that are actually missing from the sentence. That's probably like a fast reader, speed reader and trying to do too many things at once. But um, I've heard a lot of people and talk about how much they get from reading their work out loud when they're in the revision process. I definitely have done it and have seen improvements from it. <clears throat> and then I saw this quote um, from Toni Morrison, who just recently passed away. Everybody was posting a lot of things that, you know, she worked on and things she said and how they influenced her, but I, and I tried to find it for the, I tried for like an hour to try and find the exact quote, so I'm paraphrasing, but she was talking about editing her her book and how she does not read her words out loud during the revision process, 
again paraphrasing her words she said something to the effect of that the goal of what we're doing is to get the reader to connect with the words when they aren't read out loud but internally you want them to connect with it without hearing them out loud so it kind of changed my thought process a little bit to think about it like that I I do think that reading out loud is helpful like I said, to catch forgotten words and weird sentences, but I really love Tony's thought there. You know, we don't usually read novels out loud to ourselves, although audiobooks are amazing, and I've listened to a lot of good ones. So I think it's, I think, you know, there's an argument for both sides for sure, but I just loved what Tony said because it's a little bit different than what you hear from people. Um, so I might not stop reading out loud completely, but maybe I'll just keep it to scenes that feel stilted or weird when reading them as I would normally. So there's my little lit chit chat for the episode. Okay, now to the main event, because I know it's what you guys are all here for, and I love it. This is why I do this, is to bring you interviews with people in the publishing industry and authors who've gone through all of this fun stuff that we're trying to get ourselves into. But Maureen works at PS Literary Agency as an associate agent, um, she does, she tells us about her journey and all that, so I'm not going to, like, repeat everything. I think you guys will get a lot out of this interview with Maureen, so get your notepads ready, get your computer ready, so you can take some notes and learn from what Maureen has to share with us. Let's talk about what drew you to publishing and being a literary agent. Okay, so um, I was actually, I was doing my last semester of undergrad, and I was living in Italy, um, like study abroad, and mm-hmm. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do after I graduated. And, you know, I was like 22 and had no idea what I was going to do with my life, and the whole world was an open road, and I was on the phone with my, um, what is it called, advisor, and I was like, you know, I really, I want to work in books, but I don't want to be a librarian. I worked in libraries um, from like the year, from when I was 15 all the way up through college, Um I was like, it's just, you know, it's, it's not working for me. I don't yeah. want to do it for the rest of my life. But, like, I do want to kind of have this angle. And, like, I'm not a great writer. <laughs> so <laughs> that's really not my path. And she was like, I don't know if you've heard of the Columbia Publishing Course. And so um, I applied and I got in. And I thought I was going to hate New York. I was, like, so sure. You know, I was coming from, like, the mountains of California yeah. and I was like New York is fast and loud and hot and smells bad <laughs> <laughs> and like I moved here in August so like, it really was fast and loud and hot and smelled bad <laughs> <laughs> um and I just absolutely fell in love with it you know like my, I remember the first day I walked into a seminar and everyone had got there early and was reading and it was just like these are my people yes like, I'm not early, but, you know, (laughs) they're there, and they're reading, and it was so cool, and to hear, like, agents specifically talking about, like, the ways that they got to know authors, you know, agenting is such a, like, a rounded part of the business, you really get so much of everything from marketing and publicity to editing to, you know, you get to really know them as people and their lives and be a part of that journey in, like, a really unique way. That's awesome. I think that's super cool. I, um... I've always wanted to work in a library, but I feel like I would have, I don't know, I feel like I just want to read the books and hide in the stacks all day. <laughs> yes, exactly. That was my problem. <laughs> like, it's, it's a really valuable experience for, like, community building and, like, being in the community and yeah. getting to, like, help out. Like, I did, like, tutoring for um, elderly people with, like, email and computers, um, which was really valuable and cool. Um, and I felt like I was doing something, but it, it didn't really speak to that, like, creative side of me that working in the publishing industry does. For sure. That's awesome. Well, we're glad that you found your path and are where you are. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So what? how do you remember when your love of books began, or have you always just been a book lover? I, like, I hate to be cliche, but, <laughs> but I really, I've always loved books. I remember, like, being you know, like three years old sitting on my dad's lap while he read me Mike Mulligan and a steam shovel. Um, and, you know, my dad's this like big burly construction guy, but he always made sure that he like sat down with me and read me, you know, children's books about construction. I love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. I don't know how many times he read that book. I've probably had it memorized at one point, but yeah, I've always loved reading. Um, and you know, I've gone through phases with it. Like we all do. Um, I ran a book blog for a very brief period of my life. Um, 
and you know in college you're I was an English major with a minor in Italian and you can only read so much for fun when you're an English major but um I'm, I'm really grateful that I have an opportunity to read for for work now yeah that's awesome does it does it and I'm sure for you it feels like as exciting in a way because you're you have the opportunity to bring these stories into the world it's so cool um it's tough because you are like sometimes one of the first people that seen a book yeah you're like maybe the, the second or third person apart from the writer who's read it um so you always want to go into it knowing that and honoring that it, it's sort of like a special relationship of like you know, someone's really trusting you with something that they've spent a lot of time and energy on. And I always try to be really respectful of that relationship. Um, But yeah, it's really amazing to see, you know, books in their inception. I always say, um, there's a book that came out this year that I read like two years ago, and it was about 150 pages longer. And I I sat down and I read the whole thing from eight o'clock to five o'clock. And I called the person who was looking at repping it who sent it to me and I was like you have to you have to sign this person right now you have to sign them and now their book is out and it was the number one New York Times bestseller and it's really cool to see that whole process that is that's awesome yeah that's great well let's talk about the fun the fun thing real quick about this whole process which is queries which I know people always you know are dying for this information but let's in your opinion, do you think queries need to stick to the specified formula? Now, this isn't like submission guidelines for each, you know, agent or agency or whatever, but the, you know, the the formula that everybody says that you have to do out there, keep it plain and simple and just have, you know, the who, what, stakes and all that stuff. Um, it's a tough question. I... I think of queries the way that I think of, like, cover letters for job interviews, which makes it sound a lot less, like, fun. Yes. (laughs) But, (laughs) like, there's three things I want to know when I'm reading a query. I want to know why you picked me. I want to know what your book is about. And I want to know who you are. And I feel like a lot about that with job interviews and cover letters, right? Like, your first paragraph in a cover letter is supposed to be, you know, why do you want this job? And then what have you done to make you qualified for this job and then you know finally like a little closing statement so um for me it's very similar like why do you want to work with me which like if you don't have a like a you know I you know read this tweet and think that you are the perfect agent for me story that's fine Mm -hmm. (laughs) just like you know you represent this genre and it falls with it that's fine too (laughs) you were on my list and I'm just sending this email (laughs) right like sometimes it's have to be like a you know you're my soulmate <laughs> yeah <laughs> whatever yeah <laughs> um it can just be like you know you represent what do I represent like romance and rom-coms and I my book is kind of like x y and z which you mentioned you enjoy that's that's perfect yeah um for me the meat of a query letter is your plot and is your uh description of your book you know I, I've read I have pro- I've read a truly absurd number of query letters not as many as some people but oh I quite a down few. yeah <laughs> I, I interned for a long time, so I've read a lot of queries. And um, the most important part is what is your book, what happens in it, and really, like, giving me an opportunity to see those characters for the first time. You know, I, I personally, I love to know that you're published somewhere else. I love to know that you have awards, whatever. But I love the bios, too. They're like, you know, is a single mom raising three kids and two dogs. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, some kind of quirky is a barista like I love that stuff too um I just want to know who you are so when I call you we're not just meeting for the first time sort of yeah um especially because like you know we put so much of ourselves out there so that people feel that they can connect with us I like to also know who I'm talking to yeah I think that's important I think that in the research that I've done and you know you see people out there critiquing others queries um I think that there's less um emphasis on if you're unpublished and like saying those quirky things, there's less emphasis on putting that. A lot of people will be like, no, don't put that in. Not unless you have an actual book published or an award one or something like that. But I think that's important too. Yeah, no, I love to hear about people. I mean, I wouldn't go on for like 12 paragraphs. No. <laughs> like a very brief like rundown of who you are. Um, if you read like the back cover, like people's bios, 
um, in a novel, I think that can give you like a good idea of like how to frame your life. It, it's like I said, like the meat of the query for me is the plot summary. Um, so no, I don't think it has to stick to a specified formula, but I do kind of think there is a structure there. Yeah. It's so complicated. It is <laughs> I don't very want complicated. To, like, <laughs> yeah. Like I don't want to get too into the mindset of like A plus B plus B, but also there is kind of a general flow to it. Yeah. And I think it's hard too, because you see some where people completely break the rules. They, um, make their query something completely different and they, you know, get some bites or, you know, they share that they got an agent with that one. And so people will try to do the same thing, but it doesn't always work for every single person to do that. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the most important thing is that you're representing yourself, that you're representing your work. And that, like, your query letter represents you in a way that you feel is accurate. And, you know, if it doesn't speak to certain agents, that's fine. If it doesn't speak to certain editors, that's fine. Like, the most important thing is that you are being the truest version of yourself and your work. Yeah. So that when you do get that agent, you're really working with someone who understands your vision. And when you do get that editor, that they really understand your vision for your work and your career. Yeah. That's super smart. So, in, you've, you've read a lot of queries, you've seen a lot. What would you say is your number one query no-no? This is a tough question. <laughs> I, I, was, I, I told, like, 15 people. I was like, I really don't, I really don't know. Um, I'm sure there's many things that you could think about for this one. <laughs> no, that sounds terrible. It's, it's more that, like, some things work for some people and don't work for other yes. people. So, I guess if I was going to be really, really general about it, um don't query me with genres I don't represent just because I I don't represent it so like no matter how great it sounds I'm like I would love to give this to a person who can appreciate it um and also like I really stay away from things that sound you know racist homophobic sexist etc um that's like please don't be racist sexist homophobic in general yeah nobody (laughs) wants that (laughs) Super don't send it to me. I mean, and I think sometimes maybe people could think, oh, maybe she doesn't represent this genre, but she'll send it to somebody who does. But you probably don't have time to do that with every query you get that you don't represent that genre, right? Um, I know, I do know a lot of agents who are like, oh, I know someone perfect for this, but if I don't know someone perfect for it, then yeah, it's, if it's someone within my own agency, I might forward it on to them and say, oh, hey, but also they you know, they may have seen it earlier as well. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> my next one is what things in a query or first pages that people will send you will make you stop reading? Probably the racist, homophobic, sexist stuff too, right? Yeah. That's, <laughs> and it, yeah, that's, that's a pretty big one for me. Um, in a query specifically, like a genre I don't represent will make me stop reading pretty quickly just because I don't know, like it, I represent genres because I know editors who work on those genres because I'm super well-versed in that market. If I'm not super well-versed in that market, it's harder for me to sell your work. Yeah. And then that's a detriment to you. Yeah. Um, in the first pages, that's a, a tougher question. I try to give everything I read about 50 pages. Um, the biggest thing that makes me stop reading is if it hasn't reached, like, the central conflict hasn't been introduced yet. Um, okay. But that kind of varies by genre. So, like, literary fiction, sometimes the central conflict is sort of a little bit more obscure. Sometimes it's the characters. You know, I would say, like, one of my favorite books is The Imperfectionist by Tom Rathman. And I would be hard-pressed to point out a central conflict in that novel. Yeah. (laughs) So, (laughs) it's, you know, it's it's very much a character study. So, it it is sort of genre-specific. But if it's a genre book, like, uh, like a like a romance or a thriller and I'm not certain of the central conflict by page 50, you know, the main plot, the overarching plot of the book, I'm like, so when are we going to get there? Right. Like when's this going to get started? Yeah. So that's tough for me. Um, obviously if it's like really incredible in other ways, like it has incredible writing or the characters are really amazing and the pacing is just kind of slow. I might keep going, but if I'm sort of on the fence and then I hit page 50 and it hasn't really gotten to where it's going, then I might stop reading. Okay. That's good to know. I think a lot of people, I think there's always qu- question about when, I think sometimes people can struggle with like the background and the setup of when your your first big central conflict or all that should happen. So that's good to know for people who right. send those first 50 pages. 
Right, and, like, your climax doesn't have to happen in the first 15 minutes. No. You don't have to, like, be even, like, necessarily, like, confronting it head on. But just, like, I'll mention that we're going to get to this, like, by page 50. Um, I was actually reading this, like, really long conversation on Twitter a couple days ago about Netflix, um, like, counting how many minutes before people stopped watching and then relaying that to producers and saying, okay, so, like, this has to get to this by X point. And I think that that's... Yeah, I think that's a little bit too prescriptive um, for writing. And, like, I genuinely believe in, like, the art of writing and the craft of it. So, like, I don't like to say, like, your pacing needs to be on this point and this point and this point. Um, But pacing is sort of a nebulous thing anyway. Yeah. (laughs) But, yeah, there there does have to be a sense of pace. Yes. You don't want to just be floundering around for those 50 pages. Right. Um, so on the flip side, now, what are your favorite things to see in a query? What are the things that you're just like, yes, finally. I absolutely love to know that someone has Googled me. It's not a requirement. I've absolutely requested probably dozens and dozens of manuscripts that they did not like, they, they knew what genres I represented. They've obviously like looked at my, you know, page on our, on our website, but like someone who references something I tweeted or like something I said in an interview it's not necessary, but it always ha- gives that, like, little extra flavor of, like, oh, you really did want, you know, to send this to me specifically. Yeah. They they were looking for you and trying to figure out how to connect. Right. Exactly. And it's, it's a good way to make me feel like, oh, like, you think this is going to be a good fit for my list and you really, like, have, have put in the work. It's, um... I know that querying feels so arduous and I know that a lot of people send out like hundreds of queries and that's why I feel like it's not necessary. Um, But if it is like, you know, your number one or somebody that you're, you really want to, you think you're going to have a great relationship with, I think it it, it adds that personal touch of pay attention to me. Yes. (laughs) This is the one. (laughs) Read my pages a little more carefully. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's psychology. Everyone loves to hear about themselves. For sure. <laughs> I think that... It doesn't have to be, like, an in-depth, like, I went 1,200 pages back on your Twitter account. Like, <laughs> it can be something I tweeted this morning. It's fine. Like, I went back to 2015 and saw you posted this. <laughs> yeah, actually, please don't do that. No, nobody wants that. <laughs> I think that there have been times when, you know, because I think... Going through agents and trying to, even just the ones, you know, if you narrow it down to a specific category or whatever, there's still so many. So I think a lot of people feel daunted. But I've had those moments where I've been looking through and I see somebody's bio or something they love and I'm like, oh, wow, they sound like an awesome person. And, you know, I get excited about that agent. So I think that's, you know, that's what you are looking for is somebody who's excited about you, who puts a little bit more effort into it besides just copy and pasting their query in an, in an email without anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, it's, you know, I've requested dozens of books that sounded amazing that yeah. they spelled my name wrong or <laughs> they put the wrong agent's name on it. It's fine. It happens to all of us. Yes. Um, but it does add that, like, next, that extra flair of, like, okay, like, all right, I'm listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, so what would you say are your tips – or golden rules for authors who are querying, who are in that in the trenches of it. Well, having never queried myself, <laughs> right? Um, it's such a strange thing because, like, I give advice on this thing that I've actually never done. Um, but my biggest tips, and they're so generic, but they're true. If you follow the guidelines and you do your best, someone hopefully who loves your work the way that you do will see it and connect with it, and that's really all you can do, you know. If you look at the guidelines on the website and you follow them and then you do your best and you try to push through it, that's all That's all you can really do. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, there's such, I feel like sometimes luck about it. Like I've heard from yeah. um, authors, one of my author friends, she um, queried in January and only sent out like four queries or something and got a request and signed right there. And other people query for years and some people, you know, you... I think it's hard for authors because these books are, they're, they're babies. It's part of your heart, you know, your your blood Absolutely. and soul is in it. And then you get a response back from an agent who's like, sorry, you just didn't connect. And they're like, what? You didn't connect yeah. with my baby, you know? Um, but I think it's, I think querying is just an important 
like personality building of the author <laughs> that process <laughs> you got to go through it a little bit get through the, the tough that stuff skin before you get the writer <laughs> yes or the, the reader <laughs> yeah build a thick skin from the agents before you have to have reviews on goodreads right <laughs> yes don't read your reviews on goodreads no don't read them uh-huh. um yeah it's it is it's timing it's luck it's the industry is changing so much too. I've been having so many conversations lately where, you know, I think I actually have seven emails about offers of rep from other agents in my inbox that I got in the last week and I have to read all of those. And wow. I'm like, isn't summer supposed to be slow? Yeah. I've what seen, are you all doing? I've seen so many tweets on from people who are like, I'm now represented. Like I'm not, I'm like, what is happening? It's like so many people. Yeah. And our summers are slow, you know, everyone goes on vacation, so I don't know if everyone's reading on their vacation or they must if be. it's just, <laughs> I, I really feel like the industry is changing, like, as, you know, we see the economy shifting and younger people having to work longer hours and take fewer vacations so that they can, you know, meet the same, the same um, quality of life yeah. that I don't, I don't know if it's that, but from the anecdotal data, it does <laughs> seem that way, but, you know, it used to be you know, Christmas was dead, like, from the 15th of December to, like, the beginning of the year, like, everyone was closed to queries, and then, like, over the summer, you couldn't sell a single thing, and then back to school was crazy again. Um, I, I, I feel like that's sort of changing the way that the luck and timing kind of works, and that's why people be like, oh, so what do you think the best time to query is? And I'm like, uh, when you're ready, when yeah. your book is done, and when you're ready to send it out. Yep. Um, <laughs> And that changes from person to person. Definitely. I think it's, I remember, I I remember, I I think I wrote my first book, I finished it when I was in high school, which, you know, it should have never, it's underneath my bed, like nobody will Mm -hmm. ever read it. But I remember I queried that book. I don't think I queried very many people, but I I wish (laughs) I could go back and find those emails and just print them out and be like, okay, you've come so far. (laughs) That that's actually really great. Like that's your that's your Stephen King nailed my reduction to the wall story yes, right there. Yeah. <laughs> so good. I I will need to find those somehow. I have access to my <laughs> old email. I can do it. <laughs> um. So, what else do you look for in an author? I know you you know you look at what's in the query, try and get to know them a little bit. But when you're on the phone and you're talking to them, um, after you've read through their work, what are your what are you looking for? So my answers are actually different for fiction and nonfiction because I do represent um, nonfiction as well. Okay. So we'll start with fiction and then we'll transition into nonfiction. Um, so for fiction, I want to make sure that we have the same vision for your for this work as well as like your long term career. Okay. Um, I I believe really strongly in like building um building a relationship with your authors and also like seeing them through not just this book but the next book and the next one. Yeah. Um. It's, it's good for me and it's also good for them, you know, that consistency and, you know, that, that trust that you get because agenting is like a very personal relationship. So it's important to me that we have the same vision, um, that, that I'm not sending someone through months and months of edits and then they turn around and it's not the book that they wanted to write yeah. anymore. So I always say, like, don't jump at the first offer, you know, have conversations with a couple of people and see who really connects with your work in the way that you do and can really visualize it and bring the most um, full version of your book to fruition. Um, And I don't really look at social media for fiction. Um, It doesn't matter if they have zero followers, if they've never heard of Twitter, um, as long as, you know, they are willing to maybe create a blog once you've gotten uh, an editor and start, you know, sending out, like, newsletters or whatever, just doing, like, some promotion for their book. It doesn't matter at the beginning of the process if they have a platform. Okay. For nonfiction, it's sort of, like, a nebulous, weird thing. Nonfiction is such a strange, um, like, uh, space in, in the industry. It's so different from fiction. So I'm looking for an author who has a really, really strong sense of voice, a marketable concept, and a platform. Um... It doesn't have to be, like, 45 million followers, but some <laughs> sense of a platform with engagement that they can, I can see that they're really connecting with their audience. Um, so in narrative nonfiction, I'm also looking at blogs, um, their social media, and any bylines that they may have in, you know, Bustle, the New York Times, whatever. Yeah. If you publish in the New York Times, 
you can query me, query at psliterary.com. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and then just because so much of nonfiction, nonfiction is this sweat, sold on proposal, the most important aspect of discovering a writer is their writing. Yeah. So I, I really want to see those examples of, of their writing before I get on the phone. Yeah, before you commit to anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. I think for fiction especially, I think a lot of um, – aspiring authors put a lot of emphasis and time on their like social media platforms Mm -hmm. to be like oh if I have this big platform then I'll be able to they'll know I can promote my book and they'll sign me better you know quicker or whatever but I've heard from I mean that's great yeah like I'm not I'm not gonna say no to someone who has 45 million followers just because they have 45 million followers but it's not it's not integral like with fiction like it's really important to me that I love your book because I'm probably going to be the one who reads it 40 more times yeah and then it's going to go to your editor who's going to read it 40 more times so (laughs) it's important for me to connect in that way and say okay like I believe in this book I believe in this work I think you have a long career ahead of you you know let's get together let's make something happen I like it I think it's good I think it's good to maybe focus for those authors a little bit more on their manuscript, less time on social media. Because social media can take up so much of your time. It's good to take Please a step back. Please get me off social media. Yes. <laughs> Please. It's really the hardest thing because I'm like, I sit here and I browse Twitter all day and I'm like, I really need to be reading and like be working. Yeah. But also, I'm, I'm in, what, what is it? My, I have so many agent friends. One of, them, one of them always says, oh, I need to have my finger on the pulse. The, of the, of the publishing world and I'm like yeah but you already get like 15 newsletters about it a day we're like publishers lunch publishers marketplace like, <laughs> we don't need to read every single tweet it's no fine. and so many of the tweets that have been going on the last couple of days have been cats and so I've been staying off twitter because I can't look yeah. at any more cats <laughs> yeah the cats <laughs> the cats um so let's talk about your manuscript wish list what is on it right now for fiction and then for nonfiction? sure so I'm just gonna give you like my most like off the top of my head things yeah because it is it is so hot that I am like really looking for <laughs> that like beach read commercial it give me that like light fluffy um romance so I'm looking for something that's like the unhoneymooner okay. which I just read like a couple weeks ago and I absolutely loved and I recommend to everyone okay um you know, enemies to lovers. They end up oh, going yeah. to Hawaii together. They hate each other, and then they stay in the same bed. It's yes. Perfect. Oh, my gosh. I want to read that book. <laughs> yes, you do. I promise you, you do. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I actually have just been reading The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo as well by Taylor Jenkins Reid, which everyone has been recommending to me for the last 100 years. <laughs> But, you know, he only has so much time in a day. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I'm looking for things like that, like commercial. You know, Seven Husbands is um, queer, which is a big part of my my whole thing. Um, I'm looking for, you know, diverse, marginalized writers um, and also, like, LGBTQ fiction. Cool. Um, yeah, in nonfiction, like, tougher. <laughs> it's tougher because it's, like... It's such a different thing. So yeah, with like, narrative nonfiction, I'm looking for biography. I love a good biography because I'm a giant nerd. And I love reading about other people's lives. Oh, for sure. <laughs> That's the best. I love biographies. Right. But, like, I've taken it to a new level. Like, uh, a couple months ago, I read the biography of President Andrew Johnson, who I've definitely always gotten confused with President Andrew, Andrew Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I absolutely thought they were the same person for a very long time. Um, and... <laughs> Apparently, he was the first president to have impeachment proceedings brought against him. So I fell really in love with that book. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking for a biography um, that really, like, tells a, a, either an old story in a new way. Okay. Or just has, like, a really fresh voice. Um, and then, you know, cookbooks, I'm looking for something that's really, like, different and aimed towards people who are living in this millennium that we live in where you know you don't necessarily have a ton of time and you're kind of looking for something that's healthy and easy um craft books always looking for craft books nonfiction. it's a it's a tough thing because you're like oh i see it i love it (laughs) (laughs) i love that though i um i love cookbooks i want a cookbook that's like easy family dinners are gonna take me like 20 minutes 
That's what absolutely. I want. Yes. I don't I don't even cook and I own like seven hundred cookbooks. It's not funny at all. <laughs> I have so like many cookbooks. My co- partner cooks everything and I'm like, I I own all these cookbooks that they've never opened. That's hysterical. I have so many cookbooks on my counter that I've never opened. And I go through them and I'm like, wow, that t- it looks like it takes way too long when I'm ever right. gonna be able to make this. Right. And like <laughs> I'm a big baker. That's that's my thing. I don't cook, I bake. So like absolutely anything baking I don't know I love baking I love baking too cupcakes cakes cookies Mm. right everything yes but cooking like he he doesn't get it he's like I don't understand you can bake which is a much more like technical thing that takes so much more energy and time but you don't want to cook which takes like 10 minutes and you taste something (laughs) I don't know I don't like cooking that's all right you just know what you like and you're gonna stick to it Exactly, right. but besides, by the time I'm done cooking something, I don't want to eat it anymore. No, you never do. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> then you see everything that's in it. That's the thing that's hard for me sometimes is, like, even with baking, too, but baking, I feel like there's less, like, weird stuff that goes in it. Like, with cooking, sometimes you see all the weird stuff that goes in your food, and you're like, I don't think that looks good anymore. Right. <laughs> or, like, I've never heard of this ingredient, and I don't know where to buy it. Yeah, or it cost me $20, and I'm not making this recipe anymore. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely uh, I did have a recipe once that I was like oh this looks good and they're like 20 ounces of caviar and I was like what 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 in the world what kind of billionaire like <laughs> yes we want cheap affordable eats that take us right. very little time <laughs> right that's what we want <laughs> Well, my last question I have for you is my favorite one, and it's sort of a hard one, too, but what is your favorite book right now? This is not your favorite book of all time, just your favorite book that you've read recently. It's The Unhoneymooners. Oh, yeah. (laughs) This is so easy. It's The Unhoneymooners. Um, I also really, really love Casey McQuiston's Red, White, and Royal Blue. Oh, yeah. Which is, yeah, it's Mm -hmm. a, like, new adult, like, uh, it's not young adult, but I want to use the word I want to use the word young and adult and not mean what young adult means in publishing. Is it like <laughs> is it like categorized as a, a young adult book or no? It's it's new adult like adult fiction. Okay. Yeah, I would personally call it like commercial women's fiction, even though it has two male reads, yeah, like male leads. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a nebulous genre bending voice right there. Um, <laughs> I love genre bending voices. That's my favorite thing to say. Oh, I love genre bending voices. <laughs> uh, what does it mean? I uh, I don't know how to explain it. No, just uh, exactly what you said. <laughs> just leave it at that. <laughs> exactly, genre bending voices. You got it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's a like political like utopia. Basically, what if we weren't living in 2019? And it's about the president of the United States' son who falls in love with the prince of England. Very sweet. Oh, I, I love, love it. Love that book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> Like I said, I, it's too hot for me to read the, like, very smart books that I love and enjoy reading. I, I love smart books. I love literary fiction. It is too hot. Your brain is doing please. way too much work keeping you cool to focus on things like that. <laughs> right. Please give me my fun romantic romp. <laughs> yes. Well, I love it. I've heard a lot about Red, White, white and Royal Blue. It's in my amazon checkout cart but my husband thinks i buy too many books so i'm waiting a little bit longer to buy any more <laughs> there's, there's no such thing as too many books i know there's he, no such thing there's not he'll come home and be like oh there's more books here i'm like i got them for free i promise somebody sent them oh, yeah. to me <laughs> i have them sent to my office i'm like i don't know what you mean yeah there is no giant box here what do you mean <laughs> I just need to do better about hiding them, I think. It's fine. It's fine. No such thing. I know. Maureen, thank you so much for chatting with me today for the podcast. It has been a blast, and I feel like I've learned so much, which is why I feel so lucky that I get to do this. But um, I hope that everybody listening here, too, learned a little bit more about you and about how to best query. Yeah, thanks for having me. I hope you learned something from it and maybe connected with Maureen in a way that now you you realize your story is the perfect fit for her. Thank you so much for listening and as always please rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. Might not seem like a super huge deal but it is definitely helpful to me. Also connect with me on Instagram and Twitter at Rose Quinney Q-U-I-N-N-Y and I'm right now on a call out for any debut authors 
or any authors who have books coming out in 2020. I'm trying to, my list for 2019 is all booked up. No more spots left for interviews. So I just want to start getting my list piled up for 2020 as I am going to be having, you know, a little maternity break at the beginning of the year in February. So I want to get some stuff lined up so that you guys don't miss out on any podcast. So any authors with books coming out in 2020 or any agents who want to chat, go ahead and connect with me on social media or head to my website rosequinco.com and let's connect thanks guys see you next week